welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, playing also live in St. Paul over SPNN. And we got an interesting show, a uh, subject that I've talked about a number of times is cameras in the courtroom, but the U.S. House Judiciary Committee uh, dealing with uh, courts, it's a subcommittee on courts, intellectual property, and the internet of the Committee of the, on the Judiciary uh, for the U.S. House of Representatives. They had a hearing yesterday about whether there should be cameras in courtrooms. It's actually, it was a bill, House file, uh, House file they call it uh, House Resolution over there, uh, 1917. And um, about opening up the courtrooms to cameras uh, for, um, as they call it, sunshine, blue sky, uh, so that people would know what's going on in the courtrooms, that people can see this branch of government in action, which I've been calling for for quite a while, but so have many uh, congressmen been calling on that, but it hasn't gotten anywhere. And, of course, the U.S. Supreme Court is against this policy because otherwise they would have cameras in the courtroom. Uh, and I think they're still on record as not wanting them. But we're going to see some videos from that hearing. But before we get that, I'm going to talk about two issues. One very briefly. We talked about the Minnesota High School, uh, uh, high school League, Minnesota State High School League, and they had a vote today on whether to allow... Uh, basically, somebody who says that's born a boy that thinks they're a girl, uh, it, w the policy allows them to play on girls' teams, and vice versa. If you're born a boy, a girl, and you think you're a boy, you get to play on boys' team, and use the locker room. Uh, so, uh, this is a, just a travesty this just does not heat need to happen very simply you just put them in their own one if they're a boy they should be playing on the boys team it doesn't matter what they think or what gender they identify with and that's the language that's used here uh, for looking at uh, I'm gonna read something here um, as they say it, it it's just outrageous and you as a parent protecting your children need to know this that um, you're going to, one, make sure that your school doesn't adopt the policy that the Minnesota State High School League has adopted. Now, the, the high school league is misinforming people, saying, well, each school can adopt the policy or they don't have to. It's just a recommendation. But that's not true. Um, so <clears throat> here's what uh, I, th I think uh, one statement that was made uh, Allison Yoakum of Transforming Families, Minnesota, and parent of transgender child says, Our kids are just like other kids. They deserve an equal shot. Everybody's equal whether you understand or don't. You can't make a choice for somebody else. Well, first of all, uh, nobody's equal, <laughs> and we have equal rights, but there's a difference between boys and girls. It's, it's a substantial difference. And to treat them as equal is, is huge. One 17-year-old said, and this is coming from the uh, Pioneer Press, uh, this is something that I feel so many people have been fighting for for so long. The passing of this will change the lives of so many transgender people who are going through hell. With the passing of this, I hope it will erase the ignorance and help people understand that trans kids are just looking for equal opportunities. Um, and the problem is it's not equal, you know, um, play with the sex that you were born with. So anyway, it's a huge, and there will be a big disruption, um, in the religious schools. Um, they're going to have to move out of the Minnesota State High School League, uh, private schools, um, uh, homeschoolers everybody's going to have to reevaluate how they're going to do it and and what they're going to it's going to mess up the Minnesota State High School League they haven't figured that out yet uh, and lawsuits all over the place are going to come into play so interesting uh, hopefully next week we'll have somebody from um, 
uh, uh, Child Protection League come on and explain everything that's going on and the effects so of how it affects your family, your children, and the school district and uh, what's going to be the result of that. All right, well, um, something's happening in Maplewood and for some reason the Maplewood City Council is not wanting Alan Cantrude as their attorney anymore. And, you know, I think that's too bad. He was uh, a nice guy, and I think he did a, a good job for them. He did what they wanted him to do, uh, but I know in a couple of situations, they put him in a situation where he couldn't win, and they wanted him to win. So when the city uh, went after John Wyckoff, put a restraining order on him, and then also council member Kathleen Judeman put a restraining order on John and then personally and then had the city attorney defend her, which is outrageous in my mind. She should have been paying for that herself because she was doing it personally um, and not as a council person. Um, they lost the case. And I am fairly certain that attorney Cantrude told them that they were going to lose because they didn't have the law on their side and they didn't have the facts on their side. And so they lost the case and I tell you, I wish there was cameras in the courtroom. If you would have seen council member Kathleen Juniman in the courtroom, how bizarre she was, how her behavior was, how she didn't make sense and she was going to have her way no matter where she wouldn't following the lead of her attorney. I mean, it was just bad. But you know what? How do you know? I, I may be making all this up. Now, I'm going to tell you that's my interpretation of what I saw in the courtroom. But you don't know, and you can't see it for yourself because there was no camera there. And here's a city official going after, in a city, going after a citizen for trumped up reasons and you don't get to watch it and um, that's too bad but anyway the city lost their case uh, and John Wyckoff the restraining order was lifted by the judge rightly so and actually it was an administrative judge I believe or a referee I can't remember which but um, it should have been lifted it was but so they're mad at Cantrude for not winning that, at least Kathleen Juniman. I'm sure, in my opinion, she's got a beef against him now. And then when Diana Longry, who was also the attorney for John Wyckoff, went after the city because they were violating the law on property assessments, and um, Diana kept winning those cases, and Maplewood kept appealing, and, and Diana kept winning. And so they're saying their scapegoat as well, the attorney wasn't good enough. No, Cantru did what he could do. He just didn't have the law on his side. It, that was a pretty clear thing. So, um, so now Maplewood is looking for a new prosecutor for criminal and uh, then an attorney for civil cases. And on Monday they heard the uh, people, attorneys coming in for civil and or was that Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday. And then yesterday they heard the criminal side. Uh, but in that f realm uh, for the criminal side, uh, an attorney, city council member, uh, Marilee Abrams, uh, made a statement to all the attorneys, which I just, when I heard it, I'm going, wow, that's, that's bizarre. Because one, what's wrong with attorneys who are trying to get a job calling the city council members and talking to them or staff people and saying, hey, what questions do you have? But here's what council member uh, Abrams had to say about this attorney firm calling everybody. So let's run that tape. Council member Abrams. Thank you. Uh, we are all being uniform in all of the 
questions and trying to be uniform in all of the comments. And I have a comment for all of the firms. Uh, I've learned that one of the five firms that we that is participating in the criminal prosecution RFP tonight has launched an aggressive campaign contacting staff and some council members to solicit the city's business. As a fellow attorney, such a campaign to leverage the city's decision is offensive and it must stop now. I intend on contacting the Board of Professional Responsibility concerning this firm's conduct and their attempt to solicit the city's business. I also intend on contacting the League of Minnesota Cities about the firm's conduct. I am not identifying the name of the firm, obviously, but I'm reading this for each one of the firms okay. who is answering our questions tonight. Okay. Uh, wow. I just thought that was bizarre. First of all, what's wrong? What, what's offensive about it? She doesn't say, so she's just name calling here. She's making a general statement that somebody at a law firm, one law firm, was calling everybody. So obviously that law firm is going to get rated zero by uh, uh, Councilman uh, Abrams. Uh, so aggressive. What does that mean? Is it just a phone call? Uh, or is she trying to sway the other council members not to use that law firm for her own whatever reason she has because she wants somebody else? And so is she trying to tell the other council members, how can we have this law firm? Of course, we don't know who it is. And how is she going to tell the other council members unless they she violates the open meeting laws. So she's going to have to sometime come out publicly and say who that law firm was. But she also needs to say why, one, it was aggressive, why it's a violation of professional conduct, and, um, you know, why, why she has to report this. I just find it bizarre that, one, I don't think it's offensive conduct. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You're, you're, vying for a job talk to people talk to the people that are going to make the decision you know um you know unless they think there's some backhand uh hey you know you give us the job and we, we got other jobs for you what does that mean well if that's going on then we shouldn't get this general statement we need to get a specific statement that says hey they offered me uh, a, a, a specific case. They offered me a job. Uh, they offered me some money uh, in order to get this job. And, of course, these law firms make a whole lot of money on this case. Uh, they definitely do. Well, I just found that interesting right there. But we got a phone call here. So, uh, caller, do you have a comment or question? Tim Kinley. Hey. Thanks you for talking about this issue in Maplewood for hiring their new uh, legal help. Okay, and you bet. So they uh, apparently they screened. A lot of people applied more than they had as finalists. A lot of people applied. Oh, I didn't know that. the RFP. And they had a subcommittee, which was closed, you know, non-public, in secret. So just two, had to, it, it had to be just yeah. two council members then. Yeah, Mary Abrams and Marv Copen. But believe it or not, the two other people who sat on the, the, the subcommittee, which the time is not, or their location, or their agenda, or none of it was public. Also sitting on that was uh, Linda Coleman and Police Chief Paul Schnell. Now, of course, the big issue with the police chief uh, sitting on the, this sort of thing is, and him having a big, uh, a police chief, the police department having a big voice of it, it sounds by its nature, uh, especially in these times, corrupt. As you know that, you know, there's these two big uh, police brutality cases, excessive force cases, uh, where there were, they actually, this time they actually ended up killing people. Uh -huh. And of course it was the attorney, the county attorney, who ran the grand jury, jury right. that, uh, you know, presented the, the evidence of right. the police officers. And both times the police officers were, were were not indicted, so they didn't even have to, despite uh, killing right, an individual, yeah. did not even have to sit trial. <clears throat> so here right. you've got a situation, here you've got a situation where the attorney from the get-go is indebted to the police chief. Totally corrupt, and Paul Schnell being right. part of that should not if he and that, himself and that was definitely the fl that was definitely the flavor of the law firms that were presenting themselves was 
you know, we're, we're going to cover law enforcement's back. And we got a little video clip showing this uh, here that we're going to cover their back no matter what. Uh, so that was an interesting aspect. Um, any, anything else real quick, caller? we got to move on. We've got a lot of video. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you for your, your, your points there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's key as to who was in the screening process and how did everybody else get screened out. Of course, we'd want to know who those other law firms were. Um, but some of the name dropping that was going on uh, came up, and we're going to show a clip where uh, one of the firms said they knew somebody, was highly recommended by somebody, and we'll see uh, Mayor Slawick's uh, answer to that. So let's play the next clip. Steve and I together got Mabel Grove through a competitive uh, bidding process in interviews like this, and they've stayed with us since uh, we got that client in 1996, I believe it was. Um, and finally, um, there are references listed in my proposal, as well as uh, another one that we thought of was Judge Phil Carruthers um, is a Hennepin County judge, used to be a chief of the criminal division in Ramsey County, and he knows us pretty well and has worked with us uh, in the distant past and, and knows us now. Um, that's kind of a quick overview. Uh, I don't know if you want me to just tackle the questions or you want to throw them at me and I'll just uh, respond. I think we'll do that. Okay. Uh, let's see, Judge Phil. I'm sorry, keep playing that. Phil Carruthers was the first speaker that I served under, so really? I know him. Yeah, it, it, of course, we, he was only a speaker for one term, but mm -hmm. that was the sad part of that. But he went on to do great things. Yeah. And uh, the, the first question, and Chief, I don't know if. All right. Um, there was the name dropping. <laughs> of course, this attorney firm did their homework. They knew that Mayor Slawick liked Phil Carruthers and was highlighting that reference among all the references as saying Phil Carruthers likes us. Slawick obviously likes Phil Carruthers. Huh. So that was just interesting to hear. You needed to hear that Phil Carruthers was the Speaker of the House. Phil Carruthers was also the person that says judges need to be elected because judges are our lawmakers understand this he's got it totally wrong our legislature is our lawmakers but phil carruthers said judges are our lawmakers i got this on tape i've shown it over and over again he testified before a uh, senate committee on uh, judicial appointments versus elections and he said we need to have elections and i agree with them but for his reasoning which is correct if there are if judges are our lawmakers then they need to be elected, okay? And the way the legal system is going, absolutely, judges are our lawmakers, but they shouldn't be, they, and that's gotta stop, okay? Just some, you know, little connections, tying the dots here of all the different d dynamics that are going on. Okay, the other issue here is uh, um, a guest I've had on my show, Andrew Henderson, uh, his case got brought up because there's a law firm, uh, Kel Kelly and Lemons, is trying to be on the team. Now, Kelly uh, used to be the city attorney, but all of a sudden he resigned, I think, after it was disclosed that um, he was misbehaving. And, uh, and with when one hour of his, him being or within a certain period of time with him being told about his misbehavior, his law firm resigned from being the city attorneys, and that's how Alan Cantrude was then hired. Uh, but now we got Kelly's law firm coming up again, but he's having his boy, his son, and uh, the younger people presenting the case, but they bring up this case of Andrew Henderson, uh, and how they prosecuted that, that it had international attention and that they can handle high-profile cases, but they don't say they can handle them. They just said they had a high-profile case. And notice that they don't say how the case turned out. So let's watch this clip. I can talk about myself a little bit. Um, that's a lot of it's the same what Joe just covered. I would note, you know, there's this high-profile jury trial experience. It was a case we, I did last 
February that garnered some international attention dealing with uh, a public person's avail ability to film police officers and specifically ambulance medical personnel doing a medical personnel uh, evaluation of a, of a possible patient and it went to trial and uh, you know we got a lot of a lot of contact from all over the country from all over the the globe for that matter uh, not agreeing with our charging decision but we made the charging decision and the, the Ramsey County Sheriff's Office agreed with us and uh, we pushed it through to trial okay. uh, and as I said Martin orders in the audience as well uh, he started all right that's fascinating because if you know the story yeah, Ramsey County wanted it pushed through. Little Canada had to pay the price. It cost Little Canada three, five thousand, at least five thousand dollars in court fees, and they lost because a citizen has the right to film a public official in the act of their duties. It was out in front of where he lived, and what they didn't say, and here's was the hidden message: We're going to do whatever we can to protect the police and collect protect the county uh, um, sheriffs and the county officers. We're going to prosecute even though we had no grounds to prosecute. That's what I heard in that statement because they did not say we lost the case. They also said, they also didn't say that we didn't prosecute the sheriff who didn't handle the evidence right and took the camera from the man who sh violated his constitutional rights, which there is a lawsuit going on in that case, a uh, federal lawsuit and uh, didn't say that they didn't prosecute that sheriff that took the camera and then took it home, took the, and erased the video, and then turned the video into the camera into the property uh, of the sheriff's department. Uh, they didn't say that, and they didn't prosecute that sheriff. So that's the hidden message. We had a high profile case. Understand what we did for you, policemen? And sheriffs, we protected a corrupt officer. Do you understand that? We got your back. It's outrageous. Anyway, so, some of the stuff that's going on in Maplewood. Unbelievable. All right. And, of course, they didn't want the camera picture of that because the testimony was the guy was four feet from us. He had the camera. He was three feet. He had the camera right in our face. We couldn't do our job. But if you had the video of the camera, he was on the porch. They were out in the driveway. He was at least 30 feet from them, not in their way at all. And he had every right to be filming a public event happening out in the public. And they lost the case. So filming, public, open to the public, a public trial, cameras in the courtroom. And that's where we're going to see some very interesting video here of the subcommittee on the courts, intellectual property, and the internet of the Committee on the Judiciary of the United States House of Representatives. We're talking about the bill that's called Sunshine in the Courtroom Act of 2013, and this is for federal courts, not state, and it's House Resolution 917. And they had three people there testifying for the bill, one against, and that was a federal court judge, um, uh, Judge Robinson, Julie Robinson out of Kansas. And we're going to open with her testimony first. And she's saying why we shouldn't have cameras in the courtroom and uh, go from there. Thank you, Chairman Marino and Ranking Member Deutsch and members of the subcommittee as well as the full committee. I'm Julie Robinson. I'm a United States District Judge for the District of Kansas. And I appreciate uh, Chairman Goodlot's invitation to appear today to discuss the views of the Judicial Conference of the United States regarding the issue of cameras in the courtroom and specifically H.R. 917, the Sunshine in the Courtroom Act. With your consent, I will submit a written statement into the record, and I will briefly summarize that statement this morning. I previously served as the chair of the Court Administration and Case Management Committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States, and I am familiar with the conference position regarding cameras in the courtroom. Before I discuss the concerns of the federal judiciary, I must emphasize, as did Judge Thunheim in his testimony before the House Judiciary Committee in September 2007, 
that the Judicial Conference does not speak for the Supreme Court. Therefore, I am unable to address the provisions of the bill that would authorize the broadcasting of Supreme Court proceedings. The legislation before us is designated as a bill to provide for the media coverage of federal court proceedings. For reasons that are explained in more detail in my written statement, the Judicial Conference opposes this legislation primarily because it allows the use of cameras in federal trial courts, in the district courts. If enacted, this legislation will have the potential to impair substantially the fundamental right of citizens to a fair trial while undermining court security and the safety of jurors, witnesses, and other trial participants, including judges. I would like to emphasize four points this morning regarding our concerns at the trial level. First, the intimidating effect of cameras on litigants, witnesses, and jurors can have a profoundly negative impact on the trial process. Moreover, televising a trial makes certain court orders, for example, an order sequestering witnesses, more difficult to enforce and could lead to tainted testimony from witnesses. Secondly, permitting camera coverage could become a potent negotiating tactic in pretrial settlement negotiations. Third, allowing cameras in federal courts would create security concerns and undermine the safety of jurors, witnesses, and other trial participants and heighten the level and potential of threats to judges. And fourth, Cameras can create privacy concerns for countless numbers of persons, many of whom are not even parties to the case, but about whom very personal information may be revealed. With regard to the issue of cameras in the federal courts of appeal, the conference opposes the bill's provisions permitting each appellate court panel to decide whether to allow cameras, rather than allowing that decision to be made by each court of appeals as a whole, which is the existing conference policy. The conference did not take these positions because it is against increased publicity for the federal courts. In many aspects, the federal judiciary is at the forefront of electronic innovation and transparency. Nearly every filing, every trial, every appellate argument, decision, and opinion is available and open to the public. Over the past decade, the Judicial Conference has dramatically expanded that openness by making its entire filing system electronically available to the public through the Internet. Furthermore, in September of 2010, the Judicial Conference of the United States authorized a pilot project to evaluate the effect of cameras in district court courtrooms, video, and also the effect of video recordings of these proceedings and the publication of such video recordings. The results of the pilot program, which ends in July 2015, will help the judiciary review and evaluate our concerns with the use of cameras in the district courts. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, this is not a debate about whether judges have personal concerns regarding camera coverage. It's not a debate about whether the federal courts are afraid of public scrutiny. It's not a debate about increasing the educational opportunities for the public to learn about the federal courts or the litigation process. In fact, open hearings are a hallmark of the federal judiciary. Rather, this is a question about how your constituents, individual Americans, whether they are plaintiffs, defendants, witnesses, jurors, or other participants in court proceedings, are treated by the federal judicial process. It is the fundamental duty of the federal judiciary to ensure that every citizen receives his or her constitutionally guaranteed right to a fair trial. And for the reasons discussed in my statement, the Judicial Con uh, Conference believes that the use of cameras in the trial courtroom would seriously jeopardize that right, and therefore we oppose this legislation. I would ask that my uh, written statement be um, offered and entered into the record, and I'm um, happy to answer any questions you may have. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. All right. I just find it fascinating here. So here you have freedom of the press, constitutional right, and you have a constitutional right to a fair trial. Both are constitutional rights. Okay. And so what they're saying, freedom of the press, means you could possibly not have a fair trial. That's, that's what they're saying, okay? So the, the problem with that is they should be thinking a different direction. Freedom of the press, if cameras in the courtroom, means you get a fair trial 
and increases the probability you're going to have a fair trial. That's why the courtroom stuff. That's why you have the cameras in the courtroom. Because when you didn't have access to the courts, we, that's what our, why we have our Constitution in the way. That's why we have the free press. Because courts weren't open. The public could not see. And this way, the public gets a lot more can see a lot more, learn a lot more, and, and behave uh, accordingly. Now, they're trying to blame people's behavior on the camera. No, you blame people's behavior on the people who have the behavior. Okay, so if somebody is grandstanding, if somebody is misbehaving because the camera's in the courtroom, you go after the person, not the camera. That's why if somebody shoots a gun, and kill somebody, murder somebody, we'll say murder, you go after the person who murdered the individual, you don't go after the gun. It's the same mindset there. All right, we have a caller here? No, nope, no caller, all right. Um, so I wanted you to notice some of the words that were used during this process. Uh, could, could, would, can, um, you know, may, might, you know, what you do is you give the Constitution out, you live by the Constitution, you give the freedom of the press in the courtroom, like we have in the legislature, that's how I can, you know what, I wasn't at the hearing, I got it off of C-SPAN, which our taxpayers pay for, so that you can see it, so you can hear from themselves, yeah, I'm taking selected video out of here, but you can go to C-SPAN, type in U.S. Uh, Judiciary Committee, and you could find, and type in camera, and you could find and watch the whole hearing yourself. You don't have to listen to me, okay? You don't have to have the filter of a courtroom when you can watch it yourself, uh, you don't have to have the filter of the press. You don't have to have me interpreting when you can watch it yourself. And when you talk to a lot of press people, they don't like cameras in the courtroom because then they have less influence. They can't, they can't go out there and, and sway public opinion. Well, they still can, but they have less effect because a person could watch it themselves and make their own decision based on what happened there and not the input of the press. And me, I don't care. <laughs> you know? uh, so, uh, you know, they're living in the past is, is exactly what they're doing. Uh, you know, it's, she's out there in La La Land, and that's the mindset of our federal judiciary, uh, at least this committee. Of course, she couldn't speak for the Supreme Court. Uh, and even Justice Scalia, who testified in 2007 before the, they had a hearing in the same committee in 2007, said, I can't speak for the Supreme Court. I can only speak on my behalf because why? The Supreme Court hasn't taken a vote on this issue. Uh, and they should, you know, but you got to have blue sky here. Okay, now we're going to the chair of the committee. Uh, I forgot his name, uh, but the chair here is playing devil's advocate, but I want to show you again the negative aspect and what's bad about this bill uh, that I think is bad, but he's trying to say what's good about the bill. And so let's watch what he has to say. Um, <coughs> I think it's my turn to ask some questions, and I'm staying as neutral as possible in this. I was a prosecutor at the state and at the federal level as a U.S. attorney, and I tried my own cases, so I know what goes on in the, in the federal courtroom. I'm going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate here with the two of you and get your reactions. Do we agree? that, and I've tried these cases in federal court, when a minor is involved in a case, that there is no, uh, nothing divulging who that minor is as far as a TV is concerned? Is there an agreement there? We agree. In fact, that's consistent with our privacy policy now in terms okay. of written, written um, the trial transcripts and pleadings that minors are identified by initials, okay. not by name. I certainly think that's true, and for the most part, uh, in cases where 
uh, the media does cover these trials. Uh, if, if that's what's indicated by the judge, then media will follow along with those guidelines. And I'm particularly concerned about a victim because I've prosecuted cases concerning uh, uh, sex trafficking of minors. I think in much the same way as the media often does not report the name of a victim in cases, it, it, it certainly would follow that you, you wouldn't show their identity. Do, you, do either of you have a distinction whether uh, the proceedings concern testimony, demonstrative evidence, or uh, appellate oral argument? Do you draw a distinction between the two of whether one or the other should or should not be televised, Judge? Um, again, the Circuit Courts of Appeal can make the decision as corporate bodies individually whether to, to um, allow for cameras in their courtroom. There are different concerns, but there are many more concerns at the trial court level, as I've okay. articulated today. Uh, this is probably rhetorical, but uh, I, from what I've seen, there's no money allocated for this. Who's going to pay for it? Taxpayers. Well, um, I, I would argue that if the media were allowed to cover these cases, it would be their cost, not, not the co courts. Who's going to be the, uh, for lack of better term, and I don't mean to be facetious about this, who's going to be the director? Does just my local news guy come in and take control and film, or is, is the judge now going to have the responsibility of, of being the director and, and, and calling the shots? Well, the concern that the Judicial Conference has, and the reason we structure the pilot the way we had, is that we want to be in control of the equipment to make sure that jurors or witnesses are not inadvertently recorded. If you're talking about a, you know, a live broadcast, once the toothpaste is out of the tube, it's out of the tube. You can't fix something like that. But you're right, it takes resources, it takes labor, it takes someone monitoring the equipment. Mr. Osterreicher. Well, I think there's certainly uh, ways to make sure that the jury is not uh, recorded. In the, in the OJ trial, for example, the camera was mounted on the wall above the jurors' heads. There was no way for it to look down at all, so there was no inadvertent, uh, certainly as a photojournalist, if I was told by the judge, this person doesn't get recorded, that's what that means. Am I, to, am I correctly assuming that neither one of you are, I know certainly, Judge, you're not, but uh, Attorney Osterreich, are, are you uh, saying that you do not want to have a, an individual come in the courtroom with his or her own camera and photograph this? I, I certainly think that there needs to be rules and decorum. Uh, I, I, I can't imagine just as in those trials of the century during the Lindbergh baby, where you had photographers literally running around the courtroom with big speed graph lexes. That's not what we're talking about here. So in this day and age where everybody's got a phone uh, and everybody's got a camera in that phone, I'm certainly not suggesting that everybody in the courtroom sit there and record it on their own. But I, don't, I do not hear you saying that you uh, agree with what I'm purporting here, that the court cameras are the only cameras in the courtroom and the judge controls them? Do you not agree with that? I, I, I have a problem with that. Okay. What do we do about, uh, uh, my time's running out here, but what do we do about the situation where once these uh, digital uh, uh, recordings are released, now what is going to happen when the public gets a hold of it. What's going to happen when the comedians on late night TV get a hold of it? What's going to happen when someone out there who has the ability, and it's very easy today, and, then, and my kids teach me how to do it, uh, taking that video and altering it and then putting it out on YouTube? Obviously, we had no control of any of that. And, um, but to suggest that because that's a problem, um, the public if, 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 there's, if there's value in the public having um, a right to record a proceedings, or having access, I should say, to record a proceedings, that's one of the risks attendant with that. I, I think there's always going to be a parade of horribles, and, and uh, no matter what we do, no matter I think this ahead, there's going to be an issue, but I don't think that that's a valid one. But I, I, I uh, agree with uh, my friend Judge Poe that uh, uh, we have the best legal system in the world. It's, uh, it's a sanctity that uh, we have to cherish, and I would hate to see it be ridiculed. So with that, I would 
Thank you very much for your testimony today. Okay, first of all here, you, you have a prosecutor, okay, and prosecutors, they're going to tend to not have their witnesses be seen or known, you know, uh, because they want to win their case. <laughs> they, you know, if prosecutors had their way, uh, you would never, uh, a, a person being convicted of something would never see who was testifying against them. So, you know, I mean, I think this guy was asking good questions, but uh, weren't necessarily straight up questions, uh, but they definitely need to be discussed. First of all, Court of Appeals versus District Court and, and the U.S. Supreme Court and the Federal Court of Appeals is totally different than the District Court. And those definitely, those courts need to be filmed. And they talked about who does the filming? The court does. Who pays for it? The taxpayer. I mean, these, these are some of the basic things that should be paid for. Uh, I mean, and we're doing all these extra social things when this is the, this is, these are the bottom lines essential of liberty that public gets to see what's going on in the courtroom. And the getting that out to the masses is one of our foundations for our liberty. Uh, that needs to happen. So who cares where the taxpayer pays for that? That's something the taxpayer should be paying for and the court should be providing. But who's making the rules? The legislature should make the rules, not the courts. That's what needs to happen. Uh, and so that a video gets out and people see it and it can be changed, so what? You know, that's part of life. That's part of freedom. A person could be sued for liable. Uh, the comedians can take whatever they want to it. Some of it needs to be exposed and made fun of because you see what some of these judges do, and you're going, what? What in the world just happened here? Some of it's the disrespect for the people in the courtroom, uh, but also it, it just protects everybody. It protects anybody that needs to be protected by having that camera in that courtroom. And the prosecutor talked about the sanctity of courtroom. And yes, there is a sanctity of that, but that sanctity is no longer there when it's not open to the public and things are done in the back room and things are hidden. That's what preserves the sanctity of that courtroom is it being open to the public. And um, so, I, I mean, very good things that have to be dealt with. Uh, Minnesota, you can film in the Supreme Court and the Appellate Courts, District Court, it's up to the judge and the other players. And as you're going to hear some testimony, hey, n nobody wants it recorded. You know, uh, now Michelle, Michelle McDonald ran for the Minnesota Supreme Court. She wanted her case shown. She wanted it recorded. She wanted people to see so that they would know what was really going on and they can see how police officers behave when they don't have evidence and they trump things up. Uh, so, all right, uh, we got to move on. <laughs> We're not going to probably going to see uh, two more videos here. Uh, Representative uh, Salini from uh, Rhode Island is uh, next, and I, and he's speaking in favor of the bill. So let's watch this. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the bill before us today, the Sun Sunshine in the Courtroom Act, promises to provide greater access to the public into the inner workings of our justice system. As my colleague, Congresswoman Lofgren, noted in her testimony, trials have always been open to the public, and the enactment of this legislation would expand upon that promise of transparency. And it's very hard for me to understand the argument that the quality of our system of justice or the fairness of our courts is impaired by, or is improved by limiting public access. And Judge Robinson, I want to start with you because, you know, if you look at the history of the right to a public trial, it's of course grounded in the Anglo-Saxon history and of the common law in the 17th century. And the idea of it was that the public proceedings would operate as a check against malevolent prosecution, corrupt or malleable judges, or perjurious witnesses. The idea that a public trial would aid the fact-finding mission and make uh, encourage citizens to come forward and speak truthfully, whether inc providing inculpatory or exculpatory evidence. So your testimony that the single greatest threat to uh, uh, underlying uh, uh, media exposure in the, in the courtroom is to the 
search for the truth seems to turn the Sixth Amendment right to a public trial on its head. I mean, the whole idea was it would be a check. It would provide assurances that people would be truthful because it would be exposed broadly to the public. So why do you conclude, or why, what does the Judicial Conference believe that that public, the expansion of that public trial will undermine the search for the truth rather than advance it even more? That's, um, um, that's a critical question that we're studying. The right to a public trial is sacrosanct. The right to a fair trial is sacrosanct. We're balancing those two. To the extent we have to worry, and we don't know whether, how much we have to worry, but I think anecdotally we've all experienced this, but to the extent we have to worry that a witness hedges or shades the truth is not forthcoming with, with information that they would otherwise be forthcoming with when they're, when they're testifying in front of a courtroom with, say, 20 people because they know that there may be millions of people that are watching that, including people that are of particular importance to them, like their boss or their pastor or their next door neighbor, who otherwise probably wouldn't go online and get the transcript of the trial and go through that effort. Um, it, we have to worry, um, and I gave some examples earlier in a civil case. I, I've had a, a case recently that I thought the parties might agree to record, they did not. I wasn't surprised because it was a case about trade secrets. They come into a public courtroom, they're looking around seeing who's in there, hoping none of their competitors are in there. If their competitors are in there, they have a right to be in there. But they're going to be more concerned if their competitors are out watching it on the internet, something that they won't know. Um, and this comes up in a variety of contexts. It comes up in, in terms of our witnesses are going to be concerned about hedging or shading their testimony when they are being cross-examined about a loss of consortium claim or an emotional distress claim or in a criminal case if they're a confidential informant. I mean, there are a number of concerns but, but, depending on the type of case and depending on the nature of the witness. But, but as a general rule, do you agree with the proposition that it is more likely that people will testify truthfully when it's broadly exposed? Because if you don't accept that proposition, then this notion underlying the right to a public trial doesn't make any sense. I mean, the idea is if you're going to make an assertion and the whole world is going to hear it and it's not true, then there's someone who might be able to prove it's not true. If it's a truthful statement, then you're less concerned that the whole world hears it. So I just think it, your argument or the argument of the judicial comments really undermines a basic notion of the public trial as being a very effective tool. And I was a criminal defense and civil rights lawyer uh, it did a lot of state and federal practice. And I, I think that public trial, the notion of being subjected to cross-examination and being done broadly and not in sort of a secret way or a way that limits public access actually enhances the truthfulness. But I want to go to a second question. You also said in your written testimony that the presence of cameras in the trial courtroom is likely to heighten the level and potential of threats to judges. That what is the basis for that conclusion, and have you seen any evidence in the state court practice that the presence of, of uh, uh, cameras in the courtroom has increased the level or potential for threats to judges? Of course, our study is focused on federal practice and federal district courts. We haven't studied what's happened in state courts, but there are judges who have had threats. All of us have had threats, some more serious than others. Um, no, but the, the question is about the face, presence of the cameras that, as, a, as a source of that. Well, the fact that your face is broadcast is a concern if it's the type of case where you have been, um, you know, the, 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 you have received threats. That's a concern. Um, there are a number of concerns, and that is one of them. It won't happen in every case. It probably won't happen except in a small number of cases, but nonetheless, it's a concern. Mr. Osred, you look like you were about to say something. Yeah. I, it, I can certainly understand it being a concern, but is it any more of a concern than Judge Robinson, I've never met you. Last night I went on the internet, I googled you, I found a picture of you. I said, oh, I know who to look for. It's not that difficult in this day and age. You don't need to have a proceeding of somebody testifying and having their face on television to find out what they look like. Thank you. I, my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well. Here's one of the big issues. That was a fascinating discussion, and you really see the concern of the judge there. Uh, you know, judges more likely to have uh, uh, be abused. And my, my response to that would be, one, uh, if judges are misbehaving, that's the reason they're more likely to be abused. And the camera puts a check and balance on the prosecutor and on 
uh, the judge and on the defendant. It, it's a check, the camera's a check and balance. It's so that people can see what's going on. But it's the people's behavior again that's the problem. It's not the camera. Okay, and second of all, people don't even know the camera's in the courtroom. Every courtroom has a camera and are being recorded right now. Everyone. And, but you don't know it's there. This whole notion that the camera makes this big difference, I think it's just baloney, and it's irrelevant because you have the free press. By that definition of the press being there, the press being able to show what's happening in the courtroom means that you get a fair trial. That's how that has to be interpreted. Um, so, all right, let's go to uh, the number five one, uh, Representative uh, Dooch. I uh, forget where he's from, Texas, I think. I'm not sure, or Florida. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the witnesses for being here. Uh, I want to just follow up on what you both were talking about, which is the pilot programs, the need for additional uh, investigation into whether this, this might work over the long term. And, and, and Judge Robinson, ask you to look at some of the, the cases, the most highly publicized cases that were televised um, the 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 OJ trial, William Kennedy Smith, Ted Bundy, Florida in Florida in the Florida Supreme Court, uh, where cameras are permitted, Bush v. Gore. In in those cases, certainly the three trials, um, was there evidence of of the concerns that you raised that would undermine a fair trial, intimidating effect of cameras and um, threats to judges, privacy concerns for non-parties. I mean, we, we have a long history at the state level of cases that have uh, been tried in public and on television. Um, do we, instead of simply waiting to see what we learn from, these, from the pilot, from our history, have, have your concerns uh, been addressed in, in any of these cases, or, or to what extent did we see those concerns about undermining a fair trial really um, uh, come into play? Well, I have to tell you, the high-profile ca cases that have been televised that you mentioned, I didn't watch any of them gavel to gavel. But my perception, I think, and the perception of many there were those very concerns in those cases. But I think what's far more important is to survey the people that were involved in a particular case, the lawyers, the witnesses, I mean, the things that our, our pilot's going to do. Their perceptions, I think, are much more compelling and persuasive than the perceptions of somebody who's watching it on TV, who doesn't know all the facts, who doesn't know perhaps what that witness testified to in a deposition, and whether they're shading their testimony now when they're in front of the television. But we may, we may not, viewers may not know that, but the parties involved that who's on, on whose behalf you're speaking, the concerns of the parties involved. Uh, certainly, we would have, these are issues that would have come up time and time again, or would come up time and time again, wouldn't they, as we televise trials all over the country, many of them high profile? All I can tell you, sir, is that I think it's important to survey people, and I'm not aware that in the state courts or in those cases that you mentioned mm -hmm. specifically that those participants were surveyed, that their views were um, called upon. We think it's important that the views of the participants are a part of what we consider. Once the trial is over, um, you know, they move on unless someone asks them, uh, you know, those concerns may never be raised. We and want the concerns, if any, raised in the context of the survey, and so that's why we're doing the pilot in the way we're doing and, it. And I know, Judge Robinson, that you're, um, you're, not taking, you're, you're not taking a position on the Supreme Court. That's correct? The Judicial Conference does right. not take a position, right. does not speak so, for the Supreme but Court. But it seems, and Mr. Ostreicher, I'll, I'll ask you this question, it seems that um, since uh, Judge Robinson, as you said, the real concern isn't judges playing to the cameras, it's all of these other concerns, that at the Supreme Court, um, where uh, simply appearing before the Supreme Court uh, is intimidating uh, in itself, and these other concerns uh, don't really seem to apply at all. So, Mr. Ostreicher, what is, um, what is the, the argument? Justice Kagan said that um, she worries about people playing to the cameras. Um, you've been to many Supreme Court oral, oral arguments. For anyone who's been, um, is, that a, is that a valid concern? No, uh, absolutely not. Uh, when those red and green lights comes on, come on, 
The only thing you care about is persuading the nine justices that are sitting up there uh, as to your position. Uh, I, I really think that it really does a disservice to the people, to the lawyers, to the judges, to really say that people become aware and play to the cameras. Uh, I mean, I sat in the courtroom uh, during the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, the lawyers there were going to do whatever they were going to do, regardless of whether there were cameras or not. And, and as a matter of fact, and I use this as a comparison, I believe that the public missed uh, a wonderful opportunity to see Judge Mache, who oversaw the Oklahoma City, bomb, uh, Oklahoma City bombing trial. There were cameras in the courtroom there. I mean, most people don't. Span to watch, or we're <laughs> not out of tape, We've got plenty of tape. Go to C Span to watch the rest. Uh, the judge was talking about a study that they've been doing. It was a three year study that got extended to five, uh, and, they, and they're in their last year of the study. And of course, the purpose of a study is to not dig down into the efforts. The purpose of the study is to delay uh, what they don't want to have happen. And then you design the study with parameters that put restrictions so that when the study's done, you're not going to have the res you're going to have the results you want, which is no cameras in the courtroom, rather than having a study that directly affects the issue of 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 whether the cameras work or not and whether they can be done or not. And that was seen, that was played out in this hearing. Um, so, hey, I'm all for cameras in the courtroom. Where are you at on this issue? All right, remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And freedom of the press, right to a fair trial, we need those. Remember, uh, good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week.